But I remember when I woke up and you know, my eyes were swollen shut. So all I could see, I could see some light. And I wondered whether I am in, is this how heaven looks like? You know, the lights for heaven. You know, when we see these movies, you see there'll be a bright light. And I was like, oh, this must be heaven. Because, you know, I couldn't open my eyes to see. But just when I was thinking, this is heaven, and now I'm waiting to see, you know, what happens in heaven, somebody coughed. <laughs> But I remember when I woke up and, you know, my eyes were swollen shut. So all I could see, I could see some light. And I wondered whether I am in, is this how heaven looks like? You know, the lights for heaven. You know, when we see these movies, you see there'll be a bright light. And I was like, oh, this must be heaven. Because, you know, I couldn't open my eyes to see. But just when I was thinking, this is heaven, and now I'm waiting to see, you know, what happens in heaven, somebody coughed. And I was like, ay, apana, there can't be coughing in heaven. So I was like, oh, so I'm still in the ward where I was. Because to me, I was, I was sure I'd moved on to the other life. In that very moment, I, I felt something telling me, your mission on earth is not complete. And that is where I developed the will to live, okay, the will to fight. That is when now I started, you know, learning to speak about it, as difficult as it was, as much as there was nobody to back me up and, you know, say yes, because it's a rare condition. You don't have anyone backing you up, apart from a doctor's note. But when you explain to friends or even some family members, you'll find that there's no one backing. I said, no, I need to find my will to live because there's a reason. The reason I didn't know, I was yet to discover. And as I progressed out of secondary life and went to college life, I started being able to talk more about it and not feel cocooned. And you know, I used to hide a lot. I never used to hide it anymore. I was out there talking about it, and I realized that the more I talked about it, the more strength I got within me to fight the condition. I eventually, uh, being my outspoken self, was able to attend a seminar where um, I think I was the only African person, and I gave my story, my journey to diagnosis in an African setup. And from there, that is when I was, I was given, you know, my work to try and do advocacy, not just for myself, but for other patients. So what really gave me the stamina to speak and to, you know, not feel any more, you know, like society is against me or people criticizing me is that I knew there were other people and I never wanted them to go through what I went through. So I, did, I, I, did, I made sure that I'm always speaking on behalf of these people who maybe don't have a voice. So later on is when um, I discovered that it actually, the name of the condition changed. It was called now hereditary angioedema. And there were medications locally available for this condition. So I wondered, I mean, it has taken like almost 30 years for me to discover that there was actually medication that would have prevented me from getting the frequency and severity of this condition. I was appalled. I was like, then that means that I have a chance to survive. The modern medication is very expensive and that's part of the problem and barrier to being able to bring treatment into the country is because of the cost uh, the, the, and of course the fact that it is not available on uh, our local health insurance. Um, in, unfortunately. Um, there are treatments which can be used um, to, for prophylaxis, which means to prevent attacks from coming on, which are older medications which have been used widely in the world. However, there are side effects associated with some of those and so they are not favorable if modern medication is available. So hereditary angioedema living with this condition is actually um, financially draining. Uh, basically based on the frequency of attacks and the fact that you want to live a normal life, so you always head to the hospital. That took a toll on my family. 
because uh, I would find my dad even attaching a title deed, okay, to try and cater for the cost of hospital. Uh, the medications that are there available are old medications and you know they have side effects. The modern medications that are available, the modern therapies, are actually available and they've been developed over a span of about 10 years. So they are still new. But these medications are so expensive such that um, one it's like it's like a replacement therapy because what I have is a deficiency of a protein so you have to replace the protein a replacement of that protein means one vial costs nearly half a million Kenya shillings so if I was to get this attack twice in a month that would mean one million shillings and unfortunately these um, medications I am told are called special therapies, which are not covered by NHIF. So this is something that you have to dig from your pocket. When we have the older medications, again, uh, they, they are much less expensive, um, but whether or not they are covered by NHIF, I'm not entirely sure about. So when I used to balance, do, do we do the modern medications or do we stay with the old medications which have side effects, I chose the side effects because th those will help me at least be able to realize a bit of a normal life because that's what we are all striving for as patients with rare diseases. So HAE has treatments which can be provided to help prevent attacks from coming on of these recurrent swellings. Um, there are treatments available to reduce the swelling when a swelling occurs. And there are also treatments uh, which can be given for short-term prophylaxis in advance of uh, a procedure. And there are treatments that are available in case of an attack uh, and in emergency situations. Um, there are older medications which are available in countries like Kenya and there are newer modern medications which unfortunately are lacking the availability is lacking in in, in our countries in Africa unfortunately there are uh, there are options to be able to bring in those medications however it is it is it is dependent on finding the patients and then being able to bring medication into the country so these all medications have side effects because they are uh, androgens androgens are male hormones and being a lady of course um, those male hormones brought side effects such as uh, growth of hair uh, I lost, um, uh, like my voice broke, just the same way for a man would break. Another side effect is uh, that every six months I have to get my liver checked because they're associated with liver intoxication. So you see, um, these are some of the side effects which when you are asked to balance do you take this medicine or do you take the side effects? You'd rather take the medicine and just see a few more years ahead of you, yeah? So the modern medications on their part, I've not heard of any side effects. Although those medications are not available, I mean, they're not they're accessible, but they're not available in our local hospitals. And again, because it's always the question of who is to pay, NHIF is not paying for them, then you are left with dealing with only the old medications and you deal with the side effects. Some of the older medications available do have side effects, such as hair growth, hoarseness of the voice, weight gain are very effective and have been shown to be effective at managing and preventing uh, the attacks of HAE. However, the modern medication, which is the replacement therapy of the substances that the body produces, uh, which are deficient or dysfunctional, are much, much more effective and, and are very useful and very good for use. So stigma and discrimination when you have a rare chronic disease is actually very real. Um, there are instances whereby, of course, I've lost friends. I have found myself um, not being, uh, my contract at work not being renewed because I was always unwell. 
I have found myself uh, being abandoned by people, a group of people, because they thought I was infectious. Um, so society plays a major role in adding to the trauma of a, con a person who has a rare condition. And it's very important that society also realizes that we are people who are also looking to live a normal life and to embrace people who have rare conditions. HAE is a lifelong condition which the patient has to live with. There is no known cure. However, the medications can prevent attacks from coming on and manage the attacks when they do come on. It is important for us to know and recognize and identify the patients so that we are able to give them the correct management and advise them what to do in case of an acute severe attack. And also even as a patient who has a rare condition, it's very important to have something on you that indicates you have a rare condition, maybe an emergency card or a, a wristband that can actually help in, you know, early, early detection of you as a patient when you get into a hospital or a medical facility. Patients with HAE should have a personalized uh, action plan which is given to them by their doctor. What that entails is a card or a, a, a card which gives the patient information about what medication to take as a preventative uh, uh, measure and also in case of an emergency that card goes with the patient to the hospital so that the physician knows the appropriate means for managing. Again some patients like with asthmatics, like with allergics, like with diabetics may have an alert bracelet. Those may be useful but the doctor would manage the patient using their action plan that is carried with the patient at the time. Because what we normally find is that if they, you don't have anything on you to indicate as such, when you go to the hospital, they start with the trials, okay? They start you on trials again, which is something you've already gone through. So in a nutshell, I would really ask all stakeholders from government to people in the health facilities, to doctors, to nurses to please be aware of patients who have rare diseases. We are really fighting for inclusivity in the universal health care coverage because insurances are not willing to take up these rare conditions. So I think if we all came together to support this patient with a rare condition, I think it is very possible for a rare patient to realize a normal life. For patients who have swellings, especially if there have been severe swellings affecting the airways and um, severe reactions of severe swellings in the abdomen with abdominal symptoms. It's important to be able to advise the, those patients to seek help, to seek medical assistance. If it's running in the families, you know that there's a possibility you might have this condition. Seek help. We can arrange tests for you. We can help you with identifying the cause. And we do have treatments that are available which will be able to help you controlling this situation. My advice to people who have patients who have rare conditions is that the support system is very important because we struggle with a lot of criticism out there in society people not understanding what you're going through, and not just physically, even emotionally, spiritually. You fight God every day. Why does it have to be me, you know? Well, there you've heard it from our guest, Patricia Karani, who says that hereditary angioedema, though a rare disease, it can be managed. Well, it's been another episode of Kaleki's Health Moments. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you like its contents, like the video and share as widely as possibly with your friends and
friend, your family, and don't forget to comment in the comment section down below so that we can know what kind of health stories to bring you in future. Until next time, it's bye-bye from us.